Listen in on this week's Scientific American 60 Second Science Podcasts. I'm podcast editor Steve Mursky. Want to make a dog? Well, wolves evolved into dogs at least once, but it turns out you can also make what's basically a dog by starting with wild foxes. Select the ones that do not seem to want to tear the researcher's face off and mate them to produce the next generation. Within five or six generations of, of this selecting the calmest animals, they had animals that were wagging their tails when Ludmilla would approach them, that were licking her hand when she put it into the cage. University of Louisville evolutionary biologist Lee Dugatkin talking about Ludmilla Trut of the Institute of Cytology and Genetics in Siberia. And this is strictly as a result of genetic selection. These animals are not trained to do this. They don't learn. There's no mechanism in the experiment for them to learn anything. They basic, what you're looking at is the result of genetic selection. Trut started this fox domestication experiment in the late 1950s at the age of 25 and is still running it today. She and her team are approaching their 60th generation of foxes, but they saw profound changes early on. Within five generations of selection, they had these animals that were extraordinarily docile towards humans. And then, slowly but surely, so many of the other traits that we see in domesticated animals also began to appear in these tame foxes. They tend to have floppy ears and curly tails, and they tend to have much more juvenileized facial characteristics. Trut and Dugatkin are the co-authors of the new book How to Tame a Fox and Build a Dog about this long-term study. They also wrote an article about the fox experiment in the May issue of Scientific American. An in-depth discussion with Dugatkin is available as a Science Talk podcast on our website. For Scientific American's 60 Second Science, I'm Steve Mursky. We're hearing a lot of the arguments against action on reducing CO2 being based on, well, CO2 was higher in the past, so we don't have to worry about it. Gavin Foster, a geochemist at the University of Southampton. But Foster says that's a flawed argument. For starters, just how far back in time do you have to look to find CO2 concentrations like what we expect to see in the future? And does it even make sense to compare the levels now and then? To answer these questions, Foster and his colleagues reconstructed the history of atmospheric carbon dioxide for the last 420 million years. They compiled roughly 1,500 estimates of CO2 concentrations from 112 previous studies. When the researchers combined these data, they found that atmospheric carbon dioxide went up and down over time, but that in general, it gradually declined from almost 3,000 parts per million down to less than 300 parts per million before humans started burning fossil fuels. However, we've already started to reverse that trend. If we continue on a business-as-usual scenario, by the middle of this century, CO2 could reach levels not seen in 50 million years, according to Foster's reconstruction. That's long before humans evolved, back when the climate was much warmer and there were no large ice sheets at the poles. If we continue on that trajectory, by the year 2250, concentrations could approach what they were in the Triassic 200 million years ago when dinosaurs roamed the Earth. But greenhouse gases aren't the only factor impacting Earth's climate. The sun also plays a major role. It's grown brighter over time, offsetting most of the cooling related to dropping CO2 levels, Foster's team found. And that fact has important implications for modern climate change. Because while we're headed toward a world with CO2 levels similar to what they were in the distant geologic past, it won't just be like rewinding the clock. Because the sun is now brighter than it was 200 million years ago or 400 million years ago, that radiative forcing from CO2 in the future is going to be that much more potent. And that we thought was quite a strong message that hadn't been noted before. The findings are published in the journal Nature Communications. Foster stresses that this isn't a version of what will be, but what could be. It's more of a sort of cautionary note that in the absence of any action, we will be entering a, a world quite rapidly in, you know, in the next 150 years where the climate is receiving a magnitude of forcing that, as far as we know, it hasn't received for 420 million years. It's outside the bounds of which the Earth's normally functioning. It doesn't sound like a good place to be to me. Thanks for the minute. For Scientific American 60 Second Science, I'm Julia Rosen. If your friends are happy, turns out you're more likely to be happy too. 
And if your friends are overweight, that too ups the odds you'll pack on pounds. Those effects have been shown in studies, and now researchers have identified another seemingly contagious quality, exercise. The investigators analyzed the running activity of more than a million individuals worldwide who used an exercise tracking device for five years. And they used weather patterns as a way to randomly examine different parts of that global network. If it happens to be a really nice day out, sunny and not too hot, not too cool, then that will induce people to run more. Sinan Aral, a computational social scientist at MIT. If it's a rainy day and cold, that will induce people to stay in more, on average. He says since different cities have different weather patterns, this natural experiment allowed them to ask, does a rainy day in New York affect running in San Diego? If the weather in New York causes changes in the running behavior in San Diego, it can really only be happening through peer influence of the friends who live between New York and and San Diego. And that is exactly what he and his colleagues saw, that the behavior of one city's runners could indeed affect the behavior of runners in another socially connected city. The study is in the journal Nature Communications. A few caveats. Women tended to be influenced more by the female runners in their networks, and less active runners tended to influence more active runners to run more, but not so much the other way around. Still, this could be valuable intel for health professionals. We have to start thinking about consumers and citizens as networked consumers and networked citizens, where they are influenced by and influence their social network in very strong and dynamic ways that will change the way a particular intervention succeeds or fails. In other words, if your prescription is more exercise, the doctors might want to write a prescription for your friends and family, too. For Scientific American's 60 Second Science, I'm Christopher Intagliata. And tomorrow I'll be marching, because don't you think Millie would agree with the March for Science? Lisa Klein from the Materials Science and Engineering Department at Rutgers University in New Jersey On Friday evening, April 21st, she gave a talk to the chemistry department at Lehman College in the Bronx. She was filling in for the scheduled speaker, her friend Millie Dresselhaus, who sadly died in February at the age of 86. Dresselhaus, who was raised in the Bronx, was the recipient of the National Medal of Science and the Presidential Medal of Freedom. On Earth Day, we need to take care of our planet, remind others it's the only one we have, and the... uh, March for Science in New Jersey is in Trenton. The emblem for the march in D.C. is science, not silence, because science means fact-based policies, free inquiry, strong public education. She also told a story about an incident that might have helped motivate her decision to march for science. She mentions STEM, which stands for Science, Technology, Engineering, and Math, usually in an educational context. On March 28th, Education Secretary DeVos and the President's daughter uh, were filmed taking a group of young women to the uh, National Air and Space Museum, where the President's daughter said that the boys should empower the girls to stay in STEM. And I asked, do we really need the boys' permission? (laughs) And shortly after that, the budget was delivered to Congress where the President uh, removed NASA's Office of Education, which works to promote STEM for girls along with other educational initiatives. Let's move on. Okay, so what have I <laughs> For Scientific American's 60 Second Science, I'm Steve Mursky. Just like humans, fruit flies have to eat a balanced diet. They need sugar to survive. They need amino acids to make eggs, to have stem cells proliferate. They need salt. They need vitamins. Carlos Ribeiro, a neuroscientist at the Champalimau Center in Portugal. Yeast, he says, is a crucial component of the fly diet. I always say uh, yeast is the steak of the fly. Take yeast away and the flies crave it. They got to make those eggs. Ribeiro and his team found that they could also elicit that yearning for yeast by simply removing a few key amino acids from the fly's diet. 
but that only worked in flies that had their gut microbiome wiped out. Because here's the twist. When Ribeiro and his colleagues restored the standard fly gut microbiome, amino acid-deprived flies did not seek out yeast to compensate. That might seem like the gut microbes are actually working against the fly's best interest, blocking their instincts to seek out missing nutrients. But what actually happened, Ribeiro says, is that flies with the gut microbes maintained good egg production despite their nutritional deficiency, suggesting that somehow the microbes helped the flies adapt to nutrient-poor conditions. So somehow the microbes reprogrammed the metabolism of the fly to now cope better with an absence of amino acids in the diet. And that might also lead then to the fly not having to produce a strong craving for amino acids. The studies in the journal PLOS Biology. Of course, flies are not humans, but still, Ribeiro says. I think there are now more and more compelling evidence that the microbes in the gut also of humans affect behavior, for example, mood and stress, and maybe people even propose some diseases. But how microbes do so and why they would do so is completely unclear. Still, next time you're staring at a menu, undecided on what to order, you might try just going with your gut. For Scientific American's 60 Second Science, I'm Christopher Intagliata. Fossilized skulls and skeletons found in European caves give us our first glimpse of our ancient cousins, the Neanderthals, and a finger bone found in a Siberian cave first indicated the existence of another relative, the Denisovans. But fossils are hard to come by. So here's another option. Analyze cave floors to see if they contain any DNA. We find ancient hominins, we find Neanderthal mitochondrial DNA and Denisovan mitochondrial DNA. Vivian Sloan, a geneticist at the Max Planck Institute in Germany. She and her team found that molecular evidence by testing teaspoonfuls of sediment from seven different caves. And they screened specifically for mitochondrial DNA, because there's a lot more copies of it in cells compared to nucleus DNA, which has just one set per cell. The researchers uncovered genetic evidence of Denisovans where you might expect, at Denisova Cave in Siberia, which showed that their strategy was sound. They found Neanderthal DNA there, too, and at three of the other seven caves, including a cave where no Neanderthal fossils have ever been found, only artifacts and animal bones. And they found the DNA of some surprise guests, too. For example, the woolly mammoth or the woolly rhino, we have cave hyenas and cave bears. The study is in the journal Science. This preliminary success, Sloan says, means this method could be a good complement to traditional surveys. We're not trying to replace working on ancient DNA from fossils, but rather open all the archaeological sites where there are no hominin fossils for genetic analyses. Leading, hopefully, to a broader census of our ancient relatives. No bones about it. For Scientific American's 60 Second Science, I'm Christopher Intagliata. (laughs) 